All right, so I think we can get started. Mm -hmm. um, good evening, everyone. I'm Wendy brill Weinkoop. I'm the president of FAC. And today I have Anna Matthews, our FAC Advocacy Manager. Yeah. Hi everyone, Anna Matthews, FAC Advocacy Manager, like Wendy said, and it's a pleasure to be with you this evening. Um, and we wanna thank you for coming tonight, spending your evening with us to talk about a, a deep dive into California's 50% law for community college funding. So we're gonna try and uh, uh, break this apart for you so you understand what it is, what it does, the uh, origins of the legislation, the parameters, the importance of it, the overall impact. Um, and then we'll talk about some of the um, concerns that we have because there are, um, there have been in the past and there likely will be in the new near future um, legislative proposals to modify the 50% law. So this is a conversation that faculty need to be very uh, clear about and understand the conversation as we move forward. So the 50% law was um, enacted way back in 1961 um, to the point that some people have called it antiquated. Um, it is um, a requirement for all of the California community colleges to devote at least half of their discretionary funds for the unrestricted general fund um, towards instructional salaries. We have the ed code um, citation listed here so you can um, look into what the actual law says on your own. But like Wendy said, it's 50% of the unrestricted general funds that um, the 50% law requires colleges to spend on their instructional costs, so specifically classroom instruction, and that includes faculty salaries. So something that is significant is categoricals, which includes a lot of the basic needs programs that we have, um, as well as um, different, you know, different plots of funding, those are exempt from the denominator of the 50% law. So if you are told that, you know, the 50% law is preventing money from going to categoricals, categoricals are funded outside of the 50% law. So those are two completely um, different pots of money, if you will. Um, next slide, please. I'm gonna turn it over to Wendy to chat a little bit about um, why we need the 50% law and what would happen without it. So the 50% law plays an indispensable multifaceted role in upholding educational quality, opportunity, and outcomes in the California community colleges by mandating that a sizable portion of funding goes towards instruction, which is our primary goal. And it also helps maintain reasonable class sizes. This enables individualized faculty attention, active student participation, and meaningful person-to-person -person interaction, which are absolutely essential for impactful teaching and learning. Consistent investment in diverse, well-supported instructional staff and faculty amplifies the breadth of experience and perspectives colleges can provide to programs. Numerous metrics show that improved achievement, retention, and completion are all directly tied to classroom instruction quality and faculty involvement. So this law elevates standards across all of our 116 community college districts by dedicating funding specifically to instruction. Crucially, beyond mandating reasonable class sizes, the 50% law also ensures ample op course offerings exist across districts of essential high demand courses students need to access in order to efficiently pursue pathways towards degrees, certificates, transfer, or career goals. So this includes the availability of options across modalities and schedules. Traditional face-to-face, -face, hybrid, online, and accelerated courses to empower diverse learners. Simply put, this law serves as a vital safeguard for our community colleges. So if we don't have limited class sizes, we'd probably have maybe one or two sections of a high, in, a high demand class as opposed to 10. So should the 50% law disappear without equal replacement protection, we risk triggering a chain reaction of severe consequences that could significantly undermine the ability of our invaluable community college system to fulfill its vital mis public mission of empowering access, opportunity, equity, and social mobility through life-changing education. First, eliminating defined funding minimums towards instruction risks increasing class sizes across colleges. Um, beyond impacting the student experience, this restricts faculty's capacity to provide the kinds of personalized guidance and engaged instruction that data shows drive elevated outcomes. 
Second, with overburdened faculty and decreased resources, instructors would likely lack capacity outside class time to provide office hours, one-on-one -on -one mentoring, advising, and other support that struggling students often re rely on to help understand the material and stay on track. And third, there could be a, likely be a decline in daily substantive interactions on an interpersonal level between faculty and students that research shows is essential for nurturing holistic de uh, knowledge development, skill building and relationships central to keeping students motivated, developing purpose and unlocking their full academic poten potential. And fourth, we could witness an acceleration of runaway growth in non-instructional administrative positions and expenses that redirect precious funds away from classrooms, faculty, and frontline student services. Unchecked, this threatens resources for the institution's core instructional mission. So the 50% law keeps institutions focused on and accountable to their essential reason for existing in the first place serving students through learning, skill building, and pathway opportunities. All right. So when we talk about the 50% law and we um, look at the possibilities of it being changed in the near future with um, legislation on the horizon, I think it's important that, you know, we take a data-driven approach to looking at the 50% law. So I wanted to illuminate a couple of concerning trends that we have seen in the data um, regarding the 50% law lately. So I know that we call it the 50% law, but like I said, categorical funding and those pots of money are excluded from the 50% law. So if you look at the overall college budget categoricals and the Prop 98 general unrestricted funds, um, total only around 37% of overall college budgets are going towards instructional costs. And that's not to say that categorical funding is not important or those programs are not critical to the success of our students, but as community colleges, as institutions of higher education, I think it would be unacceptable for us to spend less than 37 cents on the public's dollar on educating our students. Um, and looking at the proposed changes to the 50% law, um, these would further erode the 37% that we are already struggling to keep. Um, so we need to make sure that we maintain and bolster the 50% the law, excuse me, not the 37% law, um, to make sure um, that we are prioritizing education within the classroom, because that is, of course, as educational institutions, part of our key mission. So on average, districts report reserves of 25%, and half of districts have reserves exceeding 35% of expenditures. So what we hear from opponents of the 50% law a lot of the times is that um, their district's budgets are um, down to the penny um, when it comes to trying to meet the 50% law and they're just really struggling to meet ends, make ends meet um, and cover the other needs because the 50% law is just sucking up um, their limited budgets. Um, but these statistics regarding reserves um, demonstrate that this is not necessarily the case. Um, if our districts have reserves of 25% on average, that is money that should be used in, in cases where they really feel like they um, are struggling to meet um, their budgetary needs and do things like meet the 50% law. Um, but keeping all of this money in storage um, and then trying to cut instructional funding is not going to be the solution. Um, so between 2012 and 2022, and this statistic um, was cited in the request for the Joint Legislative Audit Committee's 50% law audit, which Wendy is going to talk about in a bit, um, but it said that between 2012 and 2022, there was a 20% decrease in students, and at the same time, there was a 45% increase in administrative positions unrelated to student outcomes or student services. We hear a lot that administration has grown because the legislature has required lots of new basic needs programs and all of those need administrators to run them. But we're seeing a 45% increase in administrative positions that are not at all related to these programs, um, student outcomes and student services. Um, so this is what we're seeing, right? Decrease in students and exponential growth in administration. And if we further erode the 50% law, we're only going to see more administrative bloat. 
while we're, we already have limited funds as the community colleges. We are severely underfunded compared to our UC and CSU counterparts. Um, and really, if our money is as tight as we are being told, it should not be going primarily to administrative positions and administrative growth. Another staggering statistic is that through the like after the pandemic, student enrollment is only down 2.3%, but full-time faculty has plummeted by 16.3%. So a big part of the 50% law funds faculty salaries. Right now, like we said, that's closer to the 37% law and critics want to erode this even further. Um, and if we have less money to fund faculty salaries, um, you know, that means like Wendy said, we're going to have increased class sizes, less class availability. Our faculty are going to be overburdened. 70% um, of our classes right now are taught by part-time faculty, which is the complete opposite of the 75-25 goal. Um, and we're gonna continue going in the wrong direction if we do not prioritize um, funding our full-time faculty and, and making sure that we stay on track with those goals. It is unfair to continue to overburden our part-time faculty, many of which are freeway flyers and um, stretching themselves thin, trying to get to as many campuses as they can to make ends meet. And really like, that's not an environment that's good for their for the faculty or for the students um, because the faculty will not be able to um, dedicate the amount of time and effort that, that, I, that I'm sure that they would like to um, to each of their respective campuses. We know that there was a full-time faculty um, audit and there was hiring money that was put towards that um, that the audit determined was improperly spent or not spent at all. Um, so the legislature has put money towards funding full-time faculty and it has not been spent um, in the way that it's supposed to be spent. So if we, again, further erode the 50% law and the likelihood of us getting to where we need to be um, with our faculty hiring is limited. Um, the other thing is we found out a couple weeks ago that 80% of the money that the community colleges received as COVID funds have not been spent. So overall, there is a striking lack of transparency regarding money, um, I think, from top to bottom when it comes to the community colleges. Like I said, we are underfunded compared to the UCs and CSUs, but I can envision a completely transformed um, community college experience for our students and our faculty alike if the money that we did receive, as limited as it is, was actually spent in the way that it has been supposed to be spent. Um, so when we're talking about um, navigating these financial challenges, especially in tough budget years like this one, um, I need. I think we need to have a conversation truly um, about financial transparency of our institutions and the chancellor's office and um, make sure that we're targeting um, these big areas where we're already seeing demonstrated lacks of um, fiscal transparency instead of going straight to education and trying to pull funding from what's supposed to be going on inside the classroom. So this is a quote that Wendy um, aptly said in one of her interviews um, in a 50% law article, which is in our 50% law link tree, which I will have Wendy drop in the chat once we finish, which has a lot of great 50% law resources for um, you all to delve into. But her quote said, success doesn't just happen just in the classroom, excuse me, but it's not going to happen without education. That's still our primary goal. Of course, like we said, categoricals are critical to the support and success of our students and um, the community colleges are asked to do a lot, but we are also asked to educate our students. That is our primary mission. Um, so we need to maintain and uphold the 50% law to preserve that because otherwise things are going to go down the drain. I'm gonna hand it over to Wendy for the next slide. Okay, so a lot of you have been asking about the data um, and one of the reasons that um, we, uh, wanted to do an audit. And I want to thank uh, David Hopkins from Triple CI for um, taking the lead on this is because there is a lot of disagreement over the data. And I was trying to answer some of the questions um, in the Q&A. And then I also see some in the chat. So I know the data for uh, the audit was pulled from the Chancellor's Office Data Mart. And we have a link tree that has a link to that Data Mart we'll put in the chat in just a minute. Um, and it also has a, a, a link to the article on 80% of the state COVID money not being spent by the community colleges. So 
all of the things that we're using, you guys can look up on your own. Um, but definitely there's an argument over what the true numbers are. So, you know, hence the audit. So responding to concerns from stakeholders and stakeholders have been having this argument over the 50% law as long as I've been in the community colleges um, over, but, but the argument has been often the faculty saying, we're not investing in faculty. We have an over-reliance on part-time faculty and we have uncontrolled administrative growth. Right. So how and then we have administrators saying we don't have enough money. We don't have enough flexibility with our budgets. So so we need to get rid of the 50 percent law. So uh, the a joint legislative audit committee. Um, approved a bipartisan um, audit, a California state audit that will analyze several um, several measures, metrics trying to shed light on the effectiveness of this law and its implementation. So auditors are going to evaluate. And so the audit was uh, put through last year um, and it will take about a year to complete. So we're thinking about fall is when we're gonna see the results. But auditors are going to evaluate the compliance levels um, by taking a detailed sample and looking at 10 specific community college districts. Now the auditors get to choose those districts. We've had a lot of questions about which which districts it'll be. Um, I believe when the uh, audit request was put in, uh, we gave the list of the compliance, which is, you can see that there's some districts that are, uh, you know, a couple hundredths of a percent away from 50%. And that's again in our link tree that we'll share. Um, so they're right at the threshold. So will the auditors look at those specific districts or will they take a sampling? We're not quite sure but you can see where the districts are in their reporting on the 50% law. And about 20 years ago, there was another audit that showed that districts were not in compliance. And we also have a link to that previous audit. So where are our districts? Are they following the 50% law and are they compliant? But in, in addition to that, they're also gonna look at the changes over the past decade in expenditures on expanding administrative positions. And administration is different than staff. We're talking about administrative, we're talking about managers, right? People who tell other people what work to do um, as opposed to maybe faculty and staff who are doing work. So expanding, how, are we, have, how have we been expanding administrative positions compared to other investments in instructional faculty and in staff? And hopefully this data is going to provide context on how budget priorities have shifted in this, in this period. So the audit will um, assess ties between the use of funding and actual district enrollment numbers to determine the extent to which spending decisions align with changes in populations of students served. The audit will also determine the potential impacts of the 50% law on financing levels for non-instructional basic needs, and academic support programs, which will also play crucial roles in advancing equitable student outcomes. So we know it's more, right? Student success is more than what just happens in the classroom. It doesn't happen without the classroom, but we know our students need a lot. We wanna make sure that we're supporting our students, not simply more administrative positions. And then the overarching uh, goal for the data-driven empirically grounded findings is to inform constructive solutions, balancing instructional investments with support services. So this is a neutral third party overseer, the legislature um, that doesn't have an agenda, right? That doesn't have a necessarily have a stake in this game. And hopefully their data will be data that we can all agree upon in moving forward. Um, so hopefully we can unite right under uh, substantial structural modifications to the 50% law that will make sense. So again, we're waiting um, until fall 24 when this comes out. I just wanted to men mention sort of quickly that we do know that there will be at least one piece of legislation proposed um, to modify the 50% law this year. We've heard about at least two, but we know one is moving forward. We were, had that confirmed today. Um, whether that uh, piece of legislation will be successful or move successfully through the process, um, uh, we're not sure. We'll have to we'll have to see where we end up. Yeah. So I've seen um, some comments in the chat talking about um, different approaches that we can take to the fifty percent law, um, and I did want to say that um, I don't think anybody thinks the fifty percent law 
is perfect, right? Um, it is from the 1960s. Um, our opponents say often that um, it's an antiquated anathema and because it's old, it needs to go in this thing and that thing. I think we can all agree that it's not perfect, but we need to have a serious talk, I think, as a system about um, what reimagining the 50% law while maintaining the protections it has um, for education as our core mission could look like. So here are some of FACT's potential solutions to reforming the 50% law. So the first, um, I did see a comment in the chat about counselors and librarians. FACT is on board with that. Um, we believe that instructional costs need to be redefined in a little bit um, less narrow of a way um, to include counselors, librarians, tutors, faculty release time, and professional development under instructional costs, because these are all things that contribute um, to the educational experience of students and um, really should count as instructional. Um, so the second half of that is you know, I think it's just pure math, right? So if you if you increase what is counted under the 50% law, it can't stay the 50% law. The numerator has to increase. Um, if we redefined instructional costs by including counselors, librarians, um, et cetera, um, but we didn't raise the threshold um, for classroom spending from the 50% upwards, um, that would dilute the law's intent to uphold educational quality. Um, so the numerator does need to be increased. Um, there will be conversations had about what that should look like, how much it should be increased by, and certainly what else should be um, counted as instructional costs. Um, but this is, I believe, how, how FAC would approach it. Um, lots of the things that we've added to instructional costs, including counselors and librarians, are critical to student success. And unfortunately, that has not been reflected, I think accurately um, through the current 50% law. Um, counselors, librarians specifically are critical to student success. Um, and we do believe that they should be counted as instructional costs as long as that threshold again is raised. So I think it's really important to remind everybody on the call that the 50% law only applies to the unrestricted general fund. It is a portion of our overall budget. So again, if you pull in all the federal, state, local, grant money, everything else we get, none of that applies to 50% law. We're only talking about the unrestricted general fund. So many of, and I've seen an amazing conversation about basic needs in the chat, absolutely. But lottery funds can be used for basic needs, right? And that's outside. All the lottery funds can go to basic needs. And there are several schools who are doing that because they're like, how many supplies do our students need? We have a lot of lottery funds and we can't use them for anything else or but they're very limited, but they can be used for basic needs. Our equity money, uh, many of the districts hired counselors with that money. So there are specific pots of money for specific things or that can be used for things outside of um, instruction. And we have to remember that when we're having this conversation, because I think um, many people who want to change the law sort of when they when they're approaching the conversation, approach it like everything is fifty percent of everything a college gets has to go to instruction. Absolutely not, absolutely not. Again, it's closer to thirty seven percent, and that's just a sampling, right? So we have to be careful to remind people that there's many categorical funds that pay for a lot of these things, um, and we need to be mindful of that. Um, but if we take any money. If we add anything to that right side of the law and, and we don't and we don't change the numerator, we don't make it the 54, the 60 percent law, we're taking money away from instruction, which means class sizes will go up and student engagement will go down. Right. Faculty student engagement will go down, period. So we have to be careful as we modify um, what that will be. There are some numbers thrown around that if you add just in, just counselors and librarians into the formula, we would need to bring that up to about 57%, maybe 60%, just as a like a general ball, ballpark figure. Um, some other ideas, we could have minimum uh, counselor to student ratio. So instead of bringing in counselors, we could have a minimum ratio that if we have a certain percentage or a certain number of students, we'd need to have a certain number of counselors. Our ratios are dismal in the system. We have several thousand students for every counselor. So that could provide a mechanism that would allow students access to advisement and support. 
And then we could do a similar thing with librarian to student ratios that could also provide for better access to learning resources. But on top of that is one of my favorites. We could just limit that administrative bloat. And there you go, Arnie. We have bloat on there for you because I know you wanted it. Um, but we could simply just limit that, right? So that it's a, a percentage of the whole district's budget cannot be more than a certain amount. Um, we could cap it. That's that's an approach because honestly, that's what I think uh, most uh, people are concerned about um, if we sort of take this rule away, you know, that we'll end up with even more administration when clearly um, we have a, a very large amount of administrators in the system already. So again, the goal uh, with any potential changes should be balancing our investments, both in high quality instruction and robust student service uh, support services, rather than sacrificing one priority over the other, right? Useful optimizations grounded in objective data, and the data should come from the audit, we should wait for the audit, can strengthen our access, our affordability, and our success protections. All right, so we urge stakeholders to avoid reactionary steps towards eliminating the 50% law. We must reinforce, not dismantle the law, protecting committed investment in community college classrooms, faculty, and most importantly, our students. So the future of affordable quality community college education um, we believe depends on protecting the 50% law. So we uh, remain firmly convinced that preserving and judici judiciously strengthening the 50% law remains, vi remains vital to ensuring the combination of high quality, affordable community college education and student support. I did get the link tree in the chat. I'm sorry, I didn't send it. I was too busy multitasking. Uh, so it was operator error. It should be in there now. and. Um, we will be updating that link. So bookmark that or hold the link. Um, if you lose track of it, you can always email me and I'll send it to you. Um, but the link tree, will, we'll be updating that as we go. We'll add the recording so you guys can just share that one document. It has everything. If there's something that is uh, missing um, from that that you'd like to see, we can definitely add it. So just, just let us know. And as, as we see bills coming out, we'll be adding bills.